Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today we have a shoulder symposium with Professor Diana Mercer and Professor Frederick Madsen. Let me introduce you to Professor Mercer first. Dr. Diana Mercer is a professor in the Department of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. She received fellowship training at the University of Washington in Seattle in shoulder and elbow surgery, along with Professor Frederick Madsen. And she underwent another fellowship in hand and microsurgery. Dr. Mercer has been attending physician at the University of New Mexico Health Sciences for over a decade. Her expertise in nerve repair and orthopedic training have been revolutionary in facilitating improved clinical outcomes in patients with complex nerve injury. Our first speaker is going to be Professor Matson. Professor Matson is a professor of orthopedics at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle. Dr. Matson completed his MD at the Baylor College of Medicine in Texas. He further joined the department in Seattle and has been the chairman as well as the director of orthopedics at the University of Washington. Over the span of a few decades, he has won several awards and has been in the editorial positions of several journals, including the Clinical Orthopedics and Related Research, Journal of Orthopedic Research. He's been on the board of directors and executive committee of several organizations, including the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, American Medical Association, American Orthopedics Association. He served as the president of the American Shoulder and Elbow Society. Professor Madsen has over 250 high impact publications and has authored several book chapters in several prestigious textbooks. Prof. Matson is most well known for the book Rockwood and Matson, The Shoulder, which is now into its sixth edition, 30 years after the first edition was published. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Professor Diana Mercer and Professor Frederick Matson for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Prof. Thank you so much for inviting us to participate and uh, greetings to all of you all over the world. Uh, this is uh, the University of Washington Medical Center where I work, uh, and you can see uh, our medical center here, and you can see some of our volcanoes in the background there. Um, this is a place where I've been since 1971 and uh, really have enjoyed working here and looking forward to sharing with you some of the knowledge that we've gained uh, in practice here. Uh, I want to also... Um, Welcome uh, my good friend, Deanna Mercer from uh, Albuquerque, who is a shoulder fellow with us in 2008, 2009. So we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, shoulder and elbow surgery, but uh, most importantly, it's a great life. And uh, I've been in practice for 46 years and I'm still having a great time at the age of 77 with my practice. Uh, today, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, shoulder surgery, uh, a view from 2021. Uh, talking a little bit about technology on one hand and technique on the other. So one way to think about things is technology is something that you can buy. Uh, technique is something that uh, we as surgeons need to master um, ourselves. New technologies are rapidly coming online, and uh, it's been shown that uh, in our country anyway, that the uh, percentage of national income devoted to health care has increased by over 300%. And the majority of this rise is a result of new technologies. New technologies can be helpful for sure. Um, uh, one of the things we need to recognize uh, is that the um, these new technologies carry with them a huge financial incentive for the inventors and the companies. So our job is to sort of keep an eye on which ones really are of benefit to the patient. The graph here shows the really exponential rise in the number of uh, FDA approvals of new technologies related to shoulder and elbow alone. So it's a virtual explosion. We want to think about the value proposition, which is the benefit over and against the cost. And the way we can define the benefit is the preoperative to postoperative change in the patient's self-assessed comfort and function. And the cost has to include not only that of the implants, but also the facility, the imaging, and complications. Again, these uh, costs come in the term in the form of uh, research development, what's necessary to get it cleared by the NIH and marketing. 
we need to recognize that there's a learning curve for each technology, for each surgeon. So every time something new comes down the line, uh, each surgeon has to learn how to use it. And then a third cost is the, that of unanticipated problems that may not be recognized until years after the technology has been introduced, leaving a lot of patients with uh, dangerous technologies uh, inside their body. We did a, publish a study in February um, of this year there where we tried to uh, assess the value to the patient of new technologies in anatomic total shoulder arthroplasty. And after looking the, over the entire literature, we were unable to show that the results of anatomic shoulder arthroplasty had improved over the two decades of the study. And here you can see the, um, the, the graph showing the reported results in terms of improvement in ASES score versus time. And you can see that certainly they are not improving. So we spent a lot of money and have not made a difference for our patients. Let's look at some of these technologies uh, and think about whether they really are of benefit. As you know, many people are enamored with the idea of getting um, CT scans and 3D CT planning before shoulder arthroplasty. We like to remind folks that a CT scan costs in our country between 500 and $1,000 more than a standard set of x-rays and subjects the patient to 100 times more of the radiation. The question is, do we get any more useful information out of this expense? We like to rely on basic imaging techniques that can be obtained without a CT scan. And th this method of imaging the shoulder gives us all the information we need to manage almost all of the cases. And we use these three x-rays. Uh, on the left, you see a AP in the plane of the scapula, also known as a Grashy view. In the middle, you see what we call the axillary truth view, where the arm is abducted uh, in the plane of the scapula and an axillary view is taken. Uh, critically, we, uh, we wanna make sure that the arm is lined up with the plane of the scapula. And then on the far right is a view of the humerus, just to make sure that there is no uh, deformity of the humerus that we need to consider when performing the arthroplasty. The, what we call the axillary truth view, as I've just described to you, shows pathology in the position of function, uh, which is more germane to the patient than what we get from a CT scan obtained with the arm at the side. And here's an example. On the left, you see an AP view that does not seem to show much of a shoulder pathology. But when we get the truth view, we can see that there is posterior displacement of the head on the uh, glenoid face with loss of articular cartilage, as I'm indicating there. This is important because this position of the arm is the one that the patient uses for most of her or his function. So we call it functional decentering. The truth view shows pathology again in a position of function uh, that is different than what you see from an MRI um, taken again with the arm at the side. Here shows a shoulder with a glenoid dysplasia, but it looks like the head is lined up with the glenoid. On the other hand, when we take the truth view, we can see that the head actually drops out the back. Again, a lot more information here with a lot less cost. A lot of people take axillary views, but they're not really the axillary truth view. And here are some examples from the literature and you can see that these are not axillary truth views because we cannot see the arm in the plane of the scapula and the view is not uh, orthogonal as we will show in a subsequent slide. So here we have again, the arm lined up with the plane of the scapula, a simple view taken with the patient relaxed at the side. And you can see that uh, in these different examples, we have a remarkable consistency in the position of the shoulder blade with what we call the eye or the spinal glenoid notch being very consistent among these four patients, showing a wide variety of shoulder pathologies, a centered glenoid, a centered uh, humeral head on the glenoid, 
posteriorly displaced head on the glenoid, a markedly deformed um, glenoid with posterior subluxation, and another posteriorly uh, displaced head on a deformed uh, glenoid. Another beauty of the axillary truth view is that it gives us an, an opportunity to compare uh, post-operative and pre-operative positions of the component, which is uh, difficult and costly and um, uh, actually hazardous to repeat CT scans on patients, particularly when you don't need the information. Here we can get a pre-operative view of a posteriorly displaced head on the glenoid and the post-operative view showing a nicely centered humeral head on the glenoid. No need to get additional views and no notice again the consistency of the positioning of the x-ray obviously taken uh, at uh, two different times, but uh, gives us a great side-by-side -side comparison of what we've been able to accomplish at surgery. We compared um, our results using the truth view with um, those uh, published by Joe Iannotti for different glenoid types. And here you can see um, in the uh, shaded bars are, are our results and uh, in the blue bars are Joe Iannotti's results. And you can see that for all the different glenoid types, the results obtained with the axillary truth view shown here is remarkably the same as what uh, Joe got with the CT scans. So let's move from imaging to humeral implant technology. And again, we'll remind you that uh, each uh, new technology has a learning curve associated with it. And this uh, slide shows some of the uh, missteps taken uh, with these new technologies. So on the left, you have a shoulder uh, implanted with a big stem and it was incompletely inserted. And uh, now the patient has rocking horse loosening of the glenoid component. Here you have a, another big stem, uh, which is uh, another new advance, um, another new technology. And you can see the severe degree of stress shielding and bone loss here. And you can imagine that revising that is gonna result in fracture of the proximal humerus. And here's another example of a new technology stem. Uh, unfortunately, it was put in in bad position with uh, resulting anterior dislocation. Recently, there's been a lot of interest in short stems and stemless components, but again, these have uh, problems with the learning curve as well. You can see that with a stemless, uh, the uh, humeral head does not always wind up where it's needed. Uh, you can see here with short stems, there's problems with loosening and with stress shielding. Our approach is a very simple one uh, and a cost-effective one. We use a, uh, a thin stem. Uh, we spare the canal by not doing any reaming or um, uh, removal of the inside of the bone uh, cortex to preserve its stability. Uh, we use impaction grafting, taking bone from the resected humeral head, placing it within the canal to distribute the load all around the implant and thereby avoid um, any stress shielding problems. We minimize the fracture risk. Uh, and the nice thing is that this is easily revisable should that need uh, occur. We found that impaction allografting uh, is helpful for revising failed short stems. And here you can see a failed short stem which we revised to a long stem. We didn't need to remove any additional bone. We in fact added bone uh, to reinforce this lady's um, arm uh, because obviously it was weak in this particular location. Here she is six months after her. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Six months after, and you can see a successful revision. Same thing with this um, uh, failed stemless. Uh, this patient had an, um, a malpositioned and infected uh, stemless implant, which we revised again with a simple long stem impaction allografted um, humeral component. 
Moving on to the glenoid component, you can see that there have been a lot of new um, uh, technologies with uh, trabecular metal in-growth uh, implants, uh, with hybrid implants that contain both metal and uh, polyethylene. And again, we have a whole new set of complications that um, were not present with the all polyethylene component. Metal debris, you can see the polyethylene is completely worn. Uh, in this case, you can see that this uh, metal peg has been completely dislocated and this one has been broken. A lot of advocates for new technologies here, humeral shrinkage and new technologies. But again, looking at these results, they have complications that we hardly ever see with the standard approach, including humeral fracture and glenoid fracture with short stems and stemless components. So our standard is the all polyethylene component with a fluted central peg. Here's one manufacturer, here's another one, essentially the same. And we collected cases from 1,270 patients from 11 different uh, centers around the world uh, and showed that uh, the results were stable for these components uh, over two years um, and excellent outcomes just using a simple, straightforward uh, polyethylene component. And this was uh, included patients with all different glenoid types and pathologies. If you look at the Australian Orthopedic Association data, they had 900 cases that were followed for 10 years. And you can see with the all polyethylene cross-link component, minimal revision rate less than 5% uh, in 10 years. Some people have advocated the use of an augmented uh, glenoid component to manage posterior uh, displacement of the humeral head on the glenoid. Uh, this seems like a good idea. But as you can see here from um, inserting the component, you actually have to remove a substantial amount of bone posteriorly. So if uh, this component fails, there's less bone there than there was to start out with. People have become an enamored with 3D preoperative planning. Again, another expensive approach for um, uh, thinking about shoulders before arthroplasty. Notice that here's the AP view, but not a good axillary view. So the truth view was not used here, which probably would have revealed the same pathology that was gotten from this uh, more complicated imaging analysis system. And in this particular case, you can see with all the help of 3D preoperative planning and patient specific instrumentation, we have an overstuffed uh, humeral component. You can see the tuberosity has been pushed way out laterally. Uh, so that was not desirable. And you can even see that the head preoperatively was posteriorly displaced on the glenoid. And here, uh, postoperatively, there is anterior instability. So even though uh, fancy uh, three operative, 3D preoperative planning was applied to this case, the result is substantially worse than I think a person could have gotten with standard imaging and standard preoperative planning based on plain x-rays. So again, we want to think about whether each new technology uh, adds value to the standard approach. So here is a typical case for us. Um, here's the AP or the Grashy view. Here's the axillary view. You can worry about whether there's too much glenoid version there. We tend not to worry so much about glenoid version uh, because our approach enables us to stabilize the humeral head on the glenoid, even if it's retroverted. So here are the follow-up x-rays showing the humeral head uh, centered on a somewhat retroverted polyethylene glenoid. The way we do this is to emphasize um, bone preservation. So rather than using a guide wire that uh, limits our ability to position the glenoid reamer, we use the nub reamer just with a central pilot hole that enables us to make small adjustments in the position of the reamer so that we remove the smallest possible amount of bone uh, without particular concern for changing glenoid version. So again, our goal is preserving glenoid bone. 
Here's a, a type two, um, type B2 glenoid. There again is the preoperative view. Everybody would agree that that's a type B2. Here's the postoperative x-ray. You can see that we have anterior penetration with the central peg, which is absolutely not an issue. In fact, you could argue that having the central peg through the um, anterior cortex increases stability. You'll also note that we've used an anteriorly eccentric humeral head to balance the um, humeral head on the uh, retroverted glenoid. This is a very useful technique that allows the tuberosity to sit where it wants to sit and for us to position the humeral head where we want it to sit. Okay, go. Raise her up. Wonderful. Put it back down again. Up again. Awesome. Perfect. Thanks. So that was an ex that was the case um, whose X-rays I showed you before. So um, again, we've presented our results with um, 272 shoulders obtained without CT scans. We don't use preoperative nerve blocks. We don't. Uh, do bicep surgery unless the biceps is frayed or dislocated. We've had, not had problems with humeral glenoid fractures. And here you can see that we approached um, uh, these shoulders without changing the glenoid version. So here's preoperative and postoperative glenoid versions. We left it the way it was, but using the techniques that I just described, we were able to get all these humeral heads centered in spite of preoperative posterior decentering, postoperatively, everybody was pretty much on the line. And you can see that um, the simple shoulder tests were pretty much the same in terms of the outcome, irrespective of the preoperative glenoid pathoanatomy. So again, because everybody seems to be very worried about glenoid version, uh, we took a look at um, our work comparing glenoids that were put in more than 15 degrees of um, version, retroversion to those that were put in less than 15 degrees of version. And so here's the version and for the two groups, you can see preoperatively a lot more retroversion in the blue group. Postoperative version was unchanged. Uh, and uh, the, the benefit in terms of the change in SST was pretty much the same, perhaps even a little bit better for the retroverted glenoids. And importantly, we had no revisions in the retroverted group and 6% uh, revision in the non-retroverted group. So it's hard for us to imagine that uh, taking uh, extra bone to remove um, glenoid retroversion or using a posterior bone graft or using an augmented component is necessary for managing these cases. <clears throat> now let's talk a little bit about cuff tear arthropathy, which is another common indication for shoulder surgery. Um, we recognize that it is a, a wonderful solution for shoulders that uh, have pseudoparalysis, such as this lady who had had a previous rotator cuff repair attempt, and she had had, unfortunately, resection of her coracochromial ligament and the anterior chromium, allowing her head to escape in a superior direction. But this new technology also has new failure modes. So things that we never see with standard anatomic arthroplasty. So the base plate can fail, the glenosphere can dissociate, the shoulder can dislocate, the plastic liner can fail, the tray can break, the stem can loosen, and also some fairly devastating complications such as acromial and spine fractures, over lengthening with the risk of neurologic injury, and scapular notching. We um, looked at the US Food and Drug Administration um, MOD uh, registry and looked at 4,000 plus complications of shoulder arthroplasty. We looked at the 2,390 reports of failed reverses. Dislocation was the number one. Glenosphere dissociation, failed base plate, humeral component dissociation, liner failure, and so on, as you see there. And here are some examples of failed reverse arthroplasty and dislocation, glenosphere dissociation, base plate failure, fracture of the trunnion, and notching producing polyethylene debris. 
So we wondered whether there would be a more benign approach for taking care of shoulders that had cuff to arthropathy, but uh, had preserved active elevation. And so here's a patient that had obvious cuff to arthropathy. One can see the superior displacement of the head. So it's rubbing against the acromion uh, and uh, obviously no rotator cuff there. Uh, our technique involves measuring the native humeral head to get an idea of the exact diameter of curvature, preserving the clavipectoral fascia that extends below the coracochromial ligament, what we call the CA plus, and then making use of this nice um, coracochromial glenoid arch that's available for putting a extended head uh, arthroplasty component in to make a, essentially a ball and socket joint. So that and that are the same shoulder. This is about uh, six years postoperatively and you can see the remodeling without any evidence of further uh, destruction of the bone. Go. Great, now how about straightforward? And can you reach up your back? Yeah, yeah. And like you're gonna tuck in your shirt? Perfect. So you know that after reverse arthroplasty, Reaching up the back is often a very difficult activity. Uh, and you can see that this lady had no problem with uh, that activity after a CTA prosthesis. Here's another example. Again, that lady was nine years after surgery. Here's another example. Again, uh, nine years after arthroplasty uh, with a CTA. Uh, and you can see her motion, just no problem with her motion or her stability. She can reach anywhere she wants with her shoulder. Uh, and uh, has a durable long-term result with uh, uh, sidestepping the limitations and the complications of reverse total shoulder. And we looked at a series of these here again is the extended head arthroplasty for patients that have retained active elevation. And in this group, we had no dissociations, no base plate failures and no dislocations and no revisions with substantial improvement in their clinical outcomes. So that takes us to our sort of last uh, example of technique. Uh, and that is the Riemann run procedure, which uh, we've enjoyed uh, uh, working with for the last uh, three decades now. And we review this as putting nature's regenerative capacity to work. So we can take a shoulder like this with a essentially a posteriorly dislocated humeral head and by use of an anterior eccentric uh, humeral head component with um, uh, a reamed glenoid, we can convert that to a very durable shoulder. And here's a five-year follow-up. And you can see how mature this uh, bone implant interface is uh, without worry about progressive wear. Uh, again, these, this enables people to go back to activities that they could not possibly do with um, a standard um, um, anatomic total shoulder or with a reverse total shoulder. There are a lot of reasons that people should not consider a ream and run if the patient is not the right patient, um, if the shoulder is not the right shoulder, and if the surgeon is not the right surgeon. So all stars need to be aligned uh, to make sure that a uh, good result is um, forthcoming. Uh, these are um, special patients and they deserve special care. One of the things that's really important is keeping in close touch with them. Uh, our results are uh, published in the literature. More and more follow-up studies are coming, but the, the essential ingredients are careful patient selection, a good standardized technique, and very close follow-up. So real quickly, here's our uh, approach, um, deltal pectoral incision, looking at the axillary truth view beforehand to decide if there is centering or decentering um, of the component. That informs whether or not we do a 360 capsular release in a case like this, 
or just an anterior release in cases where there is posterior instability. We do a subscapular as peel and we preserve the biceps tendon because we believe that that is an important stabilizer of the shoulder. We um, make a head cut always at 45 degrees with the long axis of the shaft. Very careful to protect the rotator cuff in making the head cut. We do not um, ream the medullary canal. We just size it using these, um, uh, these cylindrical devices. We want to avoid an endosteal notch that will weaken the bone and subject it, sub, uh, subject it to fracture, particularly in these very active people. So we just ream to what we call love at first bite. In other words, we put the sizer down there to the point where it just contacts the uh, diaphysis um, endosteal surface and use that as the size of the component that we're gonna be implanting. On the glenoid side, once again, same theme, minimal reaming. We accept glenoid retroversion. Our goal is just to get rid of the biconcavity, which is usually present. And we under ream, uh, I'm sorry, we over ream by a couple of millimeters to allow for extra space for um, fibrocartilage to ingrow and to distribute the load across the uh, glenoid face. Um, so the steps are removing the anterior articular cartilage, burring down the crest between the anterior and posterior concavity, creating a centering hole, and then again, avoiding a guide wire and rather just um, uh, adjusting the position of the reamer so that we can conservatively create a single glenoid concavity. We use a little trial device to make sure that we've gotten rid of any tip. Uh, and once we can see that there is a good uh, match between the back of the trial component and the glenoid face, we're satisfied. We um, size the humeral head component using what we call the 40, 50, 60 rules. In other words, we want the subscapularis to reach out to where it will um, approximate with about 40 degrees of external rotation. We want about 50% of posterior translation of the humeral head on the glenoid and 60 degrees of internal rotation of the abducted arm. As I mentioned before, if there is uh, excessive posterior translation of the humeral head when the arm is raised up, we can use an anteriorly eccentric head to recenter the head in the glenoid. Impaction grafting, as we mentioned before, it's um, bone preserving. Uh, it uh, does not give rise to um, stress shielding. Uh, we're going for what's called a low canal filling ratio. In other words, the percentage of the uh, cross section here that's occupied by the uh, humeral stem is kept small. The, uh, when we insert the humeral component, we place six secure sutures at the humeral neck cut. We use uh, number two non-absorbable sutures. We're very interested in minimizing the risk of uh, cutie bacterium infections. And one of the ways that we do that is by putting topical vancomycin in the medullary canal. And then we insert the humeral component fully, leaving a, a little bit of what we call the berm. In other words, the bone at the uh, humeral neck cut showing to make sure that the position is uh, satisfactory. We're very careful to remove bone from inferior aspect of the humeral uh, component to make sure there's no contact between that and the glenoid. We call that poo corner. And then we're also careful to make sure that on external rotation, there's no contact of a posterior osteophyte or bone prominence that will cause what we refer to as open booking. Subscapularis repair is very critical um, and um, it has to be good sutures in good bone through good tendon um, and a lot of attention to uh, technique of um, suture placement and making sure that the knots are very robust. The most important of these sutures is the one that's at the top, which we call the mother stitch and often we'll put an additional reinforcing stitch across to the uh, supraspinatus just to ex provide extra uh, support for the superior corner of the subscap. 
If there is um, posterior instability, we'll consider a rotator interval plication. This is a wonderful um, adjunct because you can do this at the end of the procedure after everything is set. You can examine the stability and find out if, if there's excessive translation. If there is, these uh, rotator interval plication sutures can be added. And as the more you add, the tighter the shoulder becomes. So we usually start from uh, lateral to proximal and um, add sutures as necessary to control the translation. The sutures go from the anterior edge of the supraspinatus to the upper edge of the subscapularis. And if you find that it's too tight, you can just cut these, uh, cut the sutures out. So you've got, again, in your hands, the ability to control the amount of translation that you want. So um, our rehab program is pretty simple. Um, we don't use a brachial plexus block. It's just uh, uh, something that, that takes more time, more money, and keeps us from um, getting the patient on what we call going home medication. So here's a, a gentleman that came up from San Diego. He's 60 years old. He had uh, Raymond run the previous day, and you can see that he's got full forward uh, passive uh, elevation and he's taking only ty Tylenol. Uh, the patients do their own rehab exercises. Um, here's a gentleman from Cleveland uh, showing his early stretching exercises at two weeks after surgery. Table stretch, internal rotation in uh, abduction, fully exercise. Here he is now 10 months after surgery. Uh, doing his 100 pound uh, dumbbell presses. Um, again, this is something that uh, standard polyethylene might not hold up against, but for a lot of our patients here, uh, being able to get back to the weight room is really important. Nice. One more of those. Good. So again, the patients are doing their own rehab. This is a 35-year-old um, international athlete with, again, a biconcave glenoid. Here's her uh, post-operative films. Again, anterior eccentric uh, humeral component. And you can see her doing the bench at three months after surgery. Go. Just to say again that communication with the patient is absolutely critical. This is the kind of email that we would get from patients along with videos so we can track their progress. Uh, this is not sort of a um, do the surgery and forget the patient kind of procedure, but rather um, in-depth contact with them and support through the uh, recovery period is vital. When we compared our Raymond run results to our total shoulder results, um, they're pretty much the same. The final simple shoulder test scores were pretty much the same. The improvement in terms of maximal possible improvement were the same, but the patients were different. The Raymond run patients, 263 of them were um, largely male, um, as opposed to the total shoulders being uh, about 50-50 female. The age was younger higher percent married, many for, more from out of state commercial insurance, but critically um, a very high percentage of the Riemann run patients start out with the B2 glenoid, almost half of them, and had a substantially greater degree of glenoid retroversion than the total shoulder components. So again, there's a high degree of patient selection that goes into finding the the best patients for um, the Riemann run. You look a day different. All right, go ahead and lift them up. Great, now down to the side. Now, can you show us how to turn around and let's see how you can reach up your back? Awesome. Okay, and then turn around back again. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. So you can see that uh, this is not just an operation for uh, young people. It's an operation for um, people who want to be active and don't want to be limited um, by concerns about polyethylene fit. Better, stronger, faster.
sorry I didn't have anybody playing cricket, but you can see that it's pretty close to the same functions that I think a cricketer would use. So I just want to conclude by inviting you to um, follow things along with us uh, on the shoulder blog. Um, all you have to do is Google shoulder, shoulder blog and it'll take you to the website, uh, which looks like this. Uh, and um, we've um, got 3000 posts up there already and just uh, past the 2 million uh, page view mark. We get about 600 page views a day uh, from uh, 100 different countries. And you can see that, for example, India is one of the most common um, countries of origin of people visiting um, the shoulder blog, but also uh, Russia and a uh, large number of countries from all continents. So um, you are invited to keep up with us and it's very easy for you to uh, keep track of the sort of things we're doing. This morning I uh, posted on uh, the effect of pa losing patients to follow up uh, and uh, the inflation that that can create with shoulder outcomes. So uh, thank you all for your kind attention and uh, happy to answer any questions that you have. This is one of my other hobbies, uh, which is bird photography that uh, is a nice balance to shoulder surgery. Thanks again. Thank you, Prof. Matson, for that brilliant talk of yours. Uh, shall we start with the uh, Prof. Mercer's presentation and have the discussion then? Maybe Fine. you can just take one question from the audience. There's uh, one doc, Professor Bijendra Singh from Kent in the United Kingdom. He wants to know, he says, I like the idea of a CTA prosthesis. My concern is either you're overstuffing or undersizing. Are you still doing them? I believe um, he is talking about the CTA implant um, and once again, we use exactly the same 40, 50, 60 rules because those are the best um, uh, guidelines that I've ever found in 45 years of practice for balancing the head size. So it really has nothing to do with preoperative planning. It has to do with what we see at surgery. So we, as I tried to show you, we try to make sure that the subscapularis can reach with the arm in 40 degrees of, ab, of external rotation that there's about 50% posterior subluxation and that the internal rotation in abduction is 60 degrees. And that's the way we um, avoid uh, the problem of overstuffing. I, I'm, I'm delighted to hear um, uh, the gentleman refer to the, um, use the term overstuffing. It was one that we introduced in our book, Practical Evaluation and Management of the Shoulder back in um, the, in 1990, and um, many people are aware of this as a problem. Um, so thank you for the question. If I didn't answer it, please uh, ask again. Thank you, Prof. Madsen. I think we're ready for Prof. Mercer's uh, presentation. Over to you, Prof. Mercer. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. What an amazing talk. You know, I had the opportunity and the privilege and pleasure to spend a year in Seattle with Dr. Madsen. And every time I log on to the shoulder blog or I hear one of his talks, I always learn something. So it's pretty amazing how you can be completely immersed in it and you still have a lot to learn. So um, a lot of people would call these cases that are to follow terrifying or overwhelming. We think they're awesome. Um, they're challenges. And I think that an opportunity to help patients that maybe didn't have um, great shoulder outcomes at the get-go. So these are both uh, cases representing complications. So the first one is an 86-year-old woman whom I saw for the first time after she had had a reverse shoulder. We live in a remote state. We have a lot of Native Americans. This woman is a Native American. She's about four foot 11. Um, and she presented with shoulder pain and stiffness. She had some pain at night, um, but you know, she was living remotely on a ranch. She cared for her farm animals. She was hiking up mountains um, and she was living completely independently. And she, um, within three months of her initial evaluation for shoulder pain, um, she had a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. And 
since the operation, um, she had progressive inability to elevate the arm, pain all the time. She was unable to sleep. And she had this mass in the anterior shoulder um, and was now living with her kids. So otherwise pretty healthy lady. She takes one medication for a little hypertension. And so Dr. Matson, can you comment on sort of this path? Deanna, can you just remind us of what her function was like before her reverse total shoulder? I know you didn't do the surgery, but what, how useful was her shoulder prior to her reverse? So I asked very specific questions about that, and she was able to get plates out of the cabinet. Um, she was able to feed her animals at 4.30 in the morning. Um, she was, uh, you know, she used a, um, a walking stick because she was a little unstable on her feet, and she had been doing that for a couple of years. But other than that, her main complaint was pain. She had pain at night. She had some pain with use, but her motion was quite good. Yeah. So we live in a, on a planet where um, one of the favorite phrases of some of the so-called thought leaders is reverse total shoulder for everything. I heard that attributed to one of the common um, occupants of the podium at national meetings. So the, the, the increasing trend is no matter what the problem is, we'll just do a reverse for it. And this lady from Dr. Mercer's description did not meet our criteria for reverse total shoulder. She didn't have pseudoparalysis. She didn't have anterior instability. She had pain. So even though we don't have access to her x-rays, we can imagine that uh, she might well have done better with either a standard total shoulder arthroplasty or if she was cuff deficient with a CTA arthroplasty. And that's particularly relevant to people who live on ranches and have to do ranch things, which is not, uh, not easy. And uh, typical of people in this part of the world, she's 86 and she's still doing full duty. You know, she's taking care of everything. So now she's worse after her surgery. Um, and, uh, so as she has pain, she can't raise her arm where she could raise her arm before. So I would say the first thing we got to do in a case like this, and when we all see cases like this, is to go back and say, what can we learn? And I think what we can learn is maybe this patient had an operation that was not indicated for her. Now she's got this mass um, that we have to deal with. And so when we see a, ma a mass like that, we have to worry about uh, whether there is infection, uh, whether there is polyethylene uh, debris and wear from that, or what else, or whether it's a resolving hematoma or whatever it is. But uh, unfortunately, um, as this slide shows, she also has um, nerve injury, and that is not uncommon uh, in people that have reverses. So she's um, she's suffered greatly as a result. So we're going to have to take a look and see what this. Um, what this tissue is. Uh, so let's see what we can learn from that, Deanna. So as you mentioned, she had this funny swelling over the pectoralis muscle. Um, she had pain really with any range of motion. She could force herself to elevate about 45 degrees, but she was just not comfortable. And then she had this musculocutaneous nerve um, injury. So these are her x-rays. What are your thoughts on her um, x-ray. So she had a reverse shoulder um, and now has these findings. Yeah. So um, if we look at this, we can see that um, even though the device is very strong, it wasn't put in um, with a central screw has completely missed the, her scapula uh, so that she doesn't have the security of fixation that would have been desirable. Um, the alignment of the component is not correct and uh, is, it may well be loose um, in her scapula. Um, you can also see that uh, the humeral com uh, component has, uh, looks like it has resulted in thinning of the bone around the lateral cortex and perhaps around the tuberosity. So um, 
there has been uh, a major concern. We also get an idea that there is a soft tissue fullness, but that's not quite so easy to visualize on these plain films. So um, as Dr. Matson mentioned, she had the central screw projecting posteriorly and, and uh, we did do an EMG uh, which showed chronic neurogenic changes in the musculocutaneous nerve distribution. We did some blood work, we did a shoulder aspiration and everything came back negative. This is her, um, this is all imaging that she came in with. So she had this anterior mass that was thought to be an organized hematoma or versus uh, scar tissue. She had this looked at by other people. They thought it was a soft tissue sarcoma. Um, so, I mean, she just went down all kinds of paths dealing with the ramifications of this um, procedure. So, what, so this is, uh, go ahead. I, well, I was just gonna say that, um, it, that one of the things that happens after reverses is that there's polyethylene debris and you can get uh, a soft tissue reaction from the small particles of polyethylene floating around. So I agree with working this up because it could be any of the things that were mentioned. Um, and so getting histology is really important. Getting uh, cultures is very important. And then planning um, as a part of the uh, revision surgery is debulking this because you can see her, her skin is under so much tension that that in and of itself could be a cause of her dis some of her discomfort. So all of those things uh, were done. We sent uh, cultures, we sent tissue to pathology. Um, and what we, um, the, the surgical procedure was removal of implants and we sent all the implants for sonification to see if that grew out any bugs. What are your thoughts on this sonification technology and do you do this, Dr. Matson? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it's fine. Um, we all know that uh, with QD bacterium, it often forms a biofilm on the uh, implants. And sometimes it's uh, helpful to have sonication to shake that loose. In our institution, we just use vortexing, uh, which um, may be almost as good. But I think um, perhaps equally important to culturing the implant is to culture tissue, not just fluid, but tissue, as I know you did in this case, because yep. uh, often you have, in, even in, a, in an infected shoulder, some of the cultures will come back negative and some will, uh, will come back positive. So it's important in our book, whenever we're doing a reverse uh, revision, we always take at least five cultures total of the deep tissues. And as and you I said- Mm -hmm. And as you said, to hold them for at least two weeks because cutie bacterium is a slow grower. Yes. So we sent three cultures on her um, and we sent one from the superior aspect of the mass, one from the inferior aspect of the mass, and then a third from the shoulder joint itself. So we sent three separate cultures, plus we sent the implant off uh, for uh, sonication. And so she was admitted, um, we did a, a CTA. So let's go to that. So we um, revised her, this implant, we were able to leave the stem and exchange the head. We tried to smooth the uh, glenoid with the rule of two millimeter diametrical mismatch in hopes of getting her some congruent surface for the CTA to uh, articulate with. And, you know, again, the glenoid component of the reverse had sort of cut out some of that glenoid bone. So um, typically I don't use bone graft. Um, oftentimes they sort of underload. They tend to remodel and heal. What are your thoughts, Dr. Matson, on bone grafting something like this? I think that, uh, it is difficult because it looks like an uncontained defect um, looking at the axillary view there. Um, and sometimes the bone graft can just create a, a problem. I don't think we're trying to, in this case, to um, recreate a normal glenoid by use of the large uh, diameter humeral head that was used here. You have the opportunity of distributing her load, uh, not only on the residual glenoid, but also on the soft tissues around. So I don't think I would be too eager to um, 
to bone graft this. One of the other things uh, that you were able to do importantly, I think, is to protect her um, her humeral shaft because that looks like a component that has some ingrowth surface on it, if I'm looking correctly, uh, and trying to remove that would um, create a much bigger problem. So uh, I think it was great that you were able to save the, um, the stem of the implant. So at two weeks, she was already way better. Her pain was better. Uh, the biopsies showed fibrous tissue, benign reactive fibroconnective tissue. Um, we had no infection. At the four week mark, uh, we started pendulums, elevation, her incision healed. Um, at three months, she had good elbow motion, full, full elbow range of motion. She came to us with some elbow stiffness and a lot of atrophy. That was the thing that was most pronounced was she had so much muscle atrophy. Um, we then at, you know, at six months, she actually had 90 degrees of forward elevation. Some of it was scapulothoracic, but her arm was functional. And at the two year mark, she was back to living independently. So it took us a long time to get her back to that place. A lot of support as Dr. Matson mentioned, you know, the family was involved. There was, you know, all the kids and the, and the grandkids. And so, and everybody was on board to help her, you know, sort of get back to her prior function and she got there. So she was back to most of her activities. She still had some pain, but it was really minimal and she was, um, happy. So that was the last time I saw her was at the two-year follow-up. And so, so here. So mm -hmm. that is an awesome case. And whenever we revise or reverse to uh, a CTA or a HEMI, um, the patient frequently asks, gee, why didn't um, my original surgeon just do this operation? Because it was so much simpler and easier than going through the reverse um, so you, it's, it's really important, uh, that, uh, you not over operate on people and, and subject them to complications that, uh, they need not be at risk for. And, uh, so, um, Dr. Mercer's case helps drive home the point I was trying to make that just because a person knows how to do a reverse total shoulder is not of itself an indication for doing it. And uh, this lady may not have met the indications for it and um, uh, unfortunately had a tough course, but fortunately had an awesome outcome. Any questions on that case, Dr. Gopalan? Uh, actually, yes, we have one uh, from the audience as well. And uh, actually they want to know from both Dr. Mercer as well as Matson, what are your classic indications for a reverse shoulder arthroplasty? I'm sure we have talked about rotator cuff tear arthropathy as the number one indication for a reverse shoulder. But off late, like uh, Prof. Matson said, you do a reverse for everything. Like people are there on the podium saying that they like start overdoing things and like fractures. So what are your classic indications for a reverse? Uh, Dr. Mercer first, and uh, I mean, Prof. Mercer first, and then Prof. Matson. So I think probably the, the strongest indication for reverse is anterior superior escape. So you've had failure of your, um, you know, whether it, it was a hemi or a total shoulder or a CTA, and you have total instability of the shoulder. I think that is probably the strongest indication for a um, reverse shoulder arthroplasty. I think there is some room for reverse shoulder arthroplasty in proximal humerus fractures. And I mean, I definitely do deal with that some, um, but again, I think that you have to be really careful because it is a big surgery and a lot of these proximal humerus fractures, which is not really the topic today, um, can be managed either non-operatively or um, with the uh, fixation of the fracture. Um, and then I, I think for cuff tear uh, or rotator cuff arthropathy, there is definitely a role for reverse, but CTA also works really well. And so again, it's indications. You have to understand who you're operating on, right? It's, this is probably not a situation where, you know, a 
a person that's not you sees the patient and then size, signs them up for the surgery and they show up to your OR and you know, you're sort of bound by whatever it is that somebody else has dictated. And um, so you have to really meet the patient, understand their goals in terms of what it is that they're going to be doing for the rest of their life and try to give them a shoulder that, that matches that need, which is where the, the ream and run has really been so impactful. And um, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Matson. Yeah, so for us, it's, it's real simple. Uh, I'm going to set fractures aside. That's a different topic, but yep. for people that have um, anterior superior escape, as Dr. Mercer said, and people that have uh, pseudoparalysis, uh, those are the patients that we consider. But with respect to pseudoparalysis, we found that many of the patients that come in with a so-called pseudoparalytic shoulder can be rehabbed successfully. In other words, they come in and they can just raise their arm a little bit, but with having them do the supine press exercise, they can rehab that deltoid and, uh, uh, and really have a very successful uh, outcome without surgery at all. So like you said, uh, there are many people advocating reverses for everything, including osteoarthritis with intact rotator cuffs. That's not the way we practice. We wanna do the simplest, safest, um, and most effective procedure for them. So if in patients that have cuff tear arthropathy with painful arthritis, uh, but preserved active elevation, we'll use a CTA uh, hemiarthroplasty and uh, only use the reverse if there's anterior superior escape or um, refractory pseudoparalysis. Thank you, Prof. Matson. Uh, just as a continuum of this particular uh, topic, uh, we have a lot of residents and fellows who are on this program. Uh, can you, uh, Dr. Mercer, can you explain anterior superior escape as well as pseudoparalysis? I mean, it's a very basic thing, but all the residents and fellows, they would really be beneficial. Sure. So the, uh, the case I showed you, if you remember that lady who uh, could not raise her arm up as a part of the presentation, she had anterosuperior escape and pseudoparalysis. And what anterosuperior escape means is that the humeral head displaces to the front and up. And you could ask yourself, why does that happen? The most common cause is people have done an attempted rotator cuff repair and have sacrificed the anterior chromium and the coracochromial ligament. So um, again, prevention is really important here. And so when we, whenever we're doing rotator cuff surgery, we never do an acromioplasty and we always preserve the coracochromial arch because that's nature's safety net to prevent anterior superior escape. So if you, the shoulder is designed like this. And when we push ourselves out of bed in the morning, we're pushing that head up against the coracochromial arch. That's nature's way of supporting it. And when we walk on crutches or whether we do bar dips or whatever in the gym, it's that superior concavity that stabilizes the humeral head, whether it has a cuff on it or not. And the last thing we wanna do is to take this and convert it to that because then that happens. So it's, it's pretty clear. So for us, anterior superior escape means that when the patient tries to elevate their arm, instead of that happening, that happens. Now, pseudoparalysis, we have a very simple definition, which is the inability to actively elevate the arm more than 90 degrees. So if, if they can only do this, that's pseudoparalysis. Now you can say, well, what about people that had 87 degrees? It turns out that almost never do you have somebody who's in that sort of gray zone. It's usually either this or it's this. So pseudoparalysis for us, again, like you, I'm in a teaching program and I like to make things simple because if I make it simple, then even I can understand it and uh, it makes it easier to teach. So those are our two definitions of pseudoparalysis and anterior superior escape. And I just wanna say for the third time, Anterior superior escape is a preventable condition. And if you look at the patients that you see over the next month that have anterior superior escape, I'll bet you that the majority of them have had an attempted rotator cuff surgery that failed. And at the time of that surgery, the acromion was sacrificed as was a coracochromial ligament. 
Thank you, Prof. Matson and Prof. Musa. I think we'll go for the next case. Is it okay, Prof. Musa? Sure. So um, this next case is that of a 48-year-old. He's a math teacher. He teaches 10th grade math. So um, he is, uh, you know, a friend of one of our big dogs here at the university. And his story is very interesting. Um, 15 years prior to my meeting him, he had a left shoulder anterior dislocation. He was, he's a sporty guy. Um, and then presented with a stiff shoulder, which is kind of odd, right? Usually with um, shoulder dislocations, you have instability. He had stiffness. So he um, was seen elsewhere. He had an arthroscopic release with manipulation or anesthesia of his left shoulder. He then had continued pain. Um, he had stiffness, which recurred. He had no instability. Then subsequent MRIs, he had about 12 of them. This did happen of note um, while he was doing the, his sporting activities at school with uh, kids. And so this falls under work comp, and which is a, a totally different talk, but, um, but an important point here. So he had multiple surgeries and you know, MRIs that showed partial thickness, rotator cuff tear, bursitis, uh, biceps, tendon, fraying, labral tear. And so all of these MRI findings were used as indications for subsequent arthroscopic surgeries. And so he didn't get better. He had continued pain. He ended up uh, on a ton of narcotics and on a pain contract. So I meet him. Uh, now he's about, he's, he is uh, one year after what's this culmination of all of these interventions in this 48 year old guy ended up with a total shoulder. So as a result of the total shoulder, he had a brachial plexus injury and the brachial plexus was completely out. He had a dead arm for about three months. At that point, he started to get some function back. Um, but had sort of this funny history of intermittent uh, nerve function where he thought he was getting better and then he thought he was getting worse. And again, you know, this work comp clouds your decision making maybe a little bit because you're wondering if this guy is maybe not telling you the truth. Um, so he's now has, you know, eight out of 10 pain. He has diffuse numbness. He's otherwise pretty healthy. He's had a prior total knee because he had an ACL injury with multiple knee issues. That's the reason for his total knee. And again, he's narcotic dependent. So his exam, he has deltoid muscle atrophy. He has about, he, he falls in the pseudo paralysis category. He only has about 45 degrees of um, forward flexion and abduction. He has weakness. He has numbness. His got his arm looks just kind of shriveled up and his EMG confirms brachial plexus, plexus injury. And the pattern is denervation, re -innervation. So something is going on here. And this is his uh, pre-op imaging. Dr. Matson, what are your thoughts here? So um, what a sad story, really. Um, so, um, if, just going back real quickly, you know, he had an awful lot of surgery and had a stiff shoulder. Um, uh, whether um, he had arthritis or not, uh, as an indication for this procedure, we don't know. But again, we want to make sure that we do the appropriate surgery for the problem that he had. We're not sure whether or not he had a pain pump, for example, which um, with all the different surgeries that he had, which could have been um, a, a contributor. In any event, right now, what we have is superior as shown in the central uh, x-ray and posterior as seen in the right-hand x-ray, uh, instability of this shoulder. And um, when you, whenever you see that, you worry about a lot of things, including his nerves, including his rotator cuff. You look at that uh, axillary view on the right, and you wonder if uh, it, it, whether uh, people were careful in protecting his uh, posterior cuff when the humeral osteotomy has done, was done. But in any event, um, uh, he has recurrent instability that needs, needs treating and uh, his glenoid component is not helping. 
uh, and probably is on its way to failing because of uh, posterior polyethylene wear. So I think he um, uh, would probably benefit from revision uh, consideration of the uh, status of his cuff and probably, probably a hemiarthroplasty because we can't really use polyethylene in unstable shoulders. What do you think about the implant placement on the humeral side? Well, it looks high. Um, uh, it, 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 you know, it looks like the, the cut was made. Um, it's a funny cut. It, it looks like it's high on the AP, but it looks like it's posteriorly angulated on the axillary. Um, so my, uh, sort of thought process here was, you know, should I go through the whole process of removing everything? Um, my plan for this guy, young, relatively healthy, active, um, was a Riemann run. And, you know, obviously we don't have a native glenoid, but uh, applying the same concepts here. Um, as uh, the Riemann run procedure. And um, so in this situation, do you think you would remove the, the humeral implant or do you think you would leave it and try to work around it? Um, well, you, if, if the head comes off, you, uh, then maybe you have a shot at getting at the, uh, uh, the glenoid and removing that. And then you can decide um, with trialing whether or not uh, you can achieve stability with the um, stem that he has in place. Again, this is an in-growth stem and removing those can be hazardous. We should add that I, I think uh, probably uh, over 90% of people around the world would say this guy needs a reverse total shoulder uh, because he has instability and a failed uh, arthroplasty. But like you, I would be, in this young man, I would be interested in trying something um, perhaps more benign. So um, again, we did a full on lab workup. Everything came back okay. Uh, so now our plan was a, a revision total shoulder with non-prosthetic glenoid. But as Dr. Matson mentioned, we had you know plans A through F on the back table. Um, we, Dr. Matson mentioned this rotator interval plication. I have found this to be invaluable in patients with posterior instability. It is a really powerful and very simple thing to do. And if you, when you're doing your 50% posterior translation test, if you have too much, you do a little rotator interval plication and miraculously and magically it, uh, normalizes in terms of, you know, your parameters for stability. Again, we sent a bunch of intraoperative cultures and we sent tissue to the to pathology and we were able to keep his stem. Um, we did the reaming with two millimeter diametrical mismatch. He actually had pretty good bone. He, um, you know, we trialed a bunch of different things. We made sure that we had a, a concentric shoulder and that he wasn't slipping out the back. And again, the rotator interval plication really helped with accomplishing that. So at two weeks, he was feeling better. He had absolutely no signs of infection. All of his cultures were negative. We started therapy. We started to wean him off of the narcotics, which was, that was probably the biggest project here. It wasn't even the total shoulder it, or the revision. It was more getting him off of the narcotic medication. So when we started talking about weaning him off of the narcotic medication, he started to develop all of these problems again. Well, I feel like it's unstable, it's painful. Again, you know, we brought his wife in, we brought his kids in, we had physical therapists that were consistent in his care. I find that if you have, you know, physical therapist A, then physical therapist B, then physical therapist C, it's really hard for continuity of care and progressing the patient through a solid rehabilitation program. And so we really micromanaged all of those steps. And at the two month mark, he was off of narcotics and he felt so much better. Um, he was so thankful. He felt stronger. His brachial plexus function was improving. Um, and we got him back to work. So at the two month mark, he was back to work. We gave him, you know, weight restrictions at the three month mark. He had no pain. 
He had 100 degrees of uh, forward elevation. He, uh, we bumped up his weightlifting uh, restrictions. And so at the three month mark, this is what we're looking at. So he's got a, uh, his humeral head is centered on the glenoid. He is functionally, functionally he's uh, doing very well. So at the six month uh, post-op, he had like hand cramping and twitching. I think that's, this is probably recovering nerve injury. And at the two year mark, he did never come back. So our plan was to see him once a year and he really felt like that wasn't necessary. Um, work comp wanted us to see him once a year. He didn't really have an interest in doing that. And um, he went back to life as a teacher and he's still teaching in one of our local schools and doing very well. And these are his final uh, two year follow-up uh, x-rays. So this shows so nicely um, the ability of the glenoid to heal uh, even after a uh, glenoid component has failed and been removed. And um, I think it again shows uh, the good judgment on the part of uh, Dr. Mercer in not doing more than is necessary. So. Um, if this revision had failed, a reverse remains an option, but having gone to a reverse in a 40 some odd year old uh, guy uh, and running the risk of having uh, problems getting the stem out and base plate failure, um, I think that this is the, the, a, a wonderful choice. And again, if you look at the um, radiographic joint space in between the uh, the prosthetic head and the glenoid bone, you can see a nice soft tissue interface that's developed there. And um, to underline the point that she made, you know, these patients are challenged and we need to be their companions on their journey till uh, things are over. And um, I think that uh, this is just a great example of, a, of another awesome case where less is more. And when I was seeing him in conjunction with residents and fellows, the, the question often was, well, did you bone graft the glenoid? Because the bone there almost looks like there was bone graft or something, but this is all his own capacity to heal, right? So this is all his own bone regenerative potential, which is very impressive. And maybe something that is underappreciated um, in shoulder surgery. The glenoid has a lot of capacity to heal. And that's great it. Case. Uh, Prof. Matson and uh, Prof. Musser, excellent case and great discussion. Uh, can we take one more question from the audience? As many as you'd like. I'm, uh, I've got my coffee, so I'm good for a while here. So, <laughs> okay, Prof. Uh, Prof. Can we say that? And I. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> can we say that the ream and run technique that you devise could be a very good salvage option in? some of these failures, because there's going to be an explosion of shoulder surgeries all over the world. And if you know this beautiful technique, that could be a salvage. For example, someone has done a shoulder arthroplasty and patient is in significant pain. And uh, do you think uh, this could be a good option? And what are the contraindications where you don't want to put it a, do a ream and run? Yeah. So, um, I think as Dr. Mercer's cases show, um, the, the glenoid really wants to heal as long as the ball is centered in it. If, um, and uh, when we, the, the way we got the idea of the ream and run in the first place is we were taking out a lot of loose polyethylene glenoids. And we took it out and we smoothed the surface just a little bit and by golly, those shoulders healed just like the one that you just saw. And the patients always being the people to ask the right questions said, gee, it feels so much better after you took that plastic out. I wonder why my other doctor put it in there in the first place. So polyethylene is a liability. It's a great thing, but it does have its downsides. And so I think when obviously the ream and run is not the solution for all problems and the surgeon needs to really bond with the patient, just as you heard, and work with the patient uh, throughout the recovery period, which can be long. But as long as they understand 
the principles and uh, why the rehab is so important. It can be a great um, either primary or salvage procedure. What are the contraindications to a ream and run? Uh, well, the contraindications would be that the surgeon has to, has to believe that it's going to work. Because if the patient doesn't believe it's, if the doctor doesn't believe it's going to work, then the surgeon will not have the ability to sort of make the best surgery, but also the, the best uh, recovery and support plan for that patient. So there has to be confidence on the part of the surgeon that this is going to happen. Secondly, the patient has to understand the, the procedure and buy into the recovery period, which can be longer. Um, and thirdly, the shoulder has to be right. So it's not a great operation for shoulders that have, for example, rheumatoid arthritis or that have incredibly soft bone. And obviously if patients have uh, rotator cuff deficiency, it's not the solution for pseudoparalysis or anti superior escape. But the glenoid actually, people talk a lot about glenoid pain uh, with hemiarthroplasty. And I think that that is rarely, the glenoid is rarely the cause of the pain as long as you've got a smooth ball on a smooth socket. Um, so uh, it's, it's something that uh, I think is an option for people to consider. And I like it because it's conservative. It doesn't burn bridges. And um, if, if for some reason it goes bad, you still have all the other options available to you. And Dr. Mosa, any comments? No, I agree completely. And uh, do you apply some sort of membrane after you remove, I mean, ream the glenoid to make it a smooth surface? I remember having a read about fascia, some form of fascia that you applied on the glenoid surface. What a good question that is. So when we originally were um, working on this procedure, we used a canine model. And our uh, thought was that we could put uh, something like graft jacket or restore patch or some other scaffolding over the um, glenoid to uh, provide an interface or padding or whatever. And uh, when we compared those results to the controls, which was a simple reaming, the controls won every time. In other words, putting something extra in there. Uh, and as you know, um, people have tried inserting a, some capsule. They've tried various other um, interposed membranes and those uh, procedures have not held up nearly as well as the ream and run. So I think that what you want is uh, to uh, realize the basic principle, which is producing a single concavity that the ball fits against with a couple millimeter diametral mismatch and uh, make sure that that patient moves the arm right away after surgery, which induces the desired healing of the, of the joint surface. But as far as I know, there's been no evidence that capsular interposition or um, meniscal allograft or any of those sort of things have worked nearly as well as just the reaming and the motion. That's why we call it the ream and run because you do the reaming, but the, the running part is getting that shoulder running right away afterwards which is essential. There's no way that this is going to work if you keep the arm in a sling for six weeks afterwards. Thank you, Prof. Matson. Uh, anything more, uh, Dr. Mercer? Any more questions to Prof. Matson, or shall we wind up the session? No, I think that's it. Thank you so okay. much. Uh, thank I, you, Prof. Matson, and uh, yeah, Prof. Matson, anything? I would just like to, um, if you can put in the chat my email, which is matson at uw.edu. I'd be happy to answer any questions from any of uh, your participants. It's always enjoyable having uh, interchange with people uh, from around the world with different experiences and different thoughts. Thank you, Prof. Matson. Uh, and that's all the questions that we have for the session, Prof. And uh, thank you both for this fantastic talk and really great case examples. And I'm sure we could do one more presentation later on whenever you're free. Thank you so much, both of you. <laughs> have a good day. Bye-bye. All right, have Bye. a good day. Thanks, Deanna. Thank you. So great seeing you. You look great. You look even.